this is Yara Stark and welcome to the Entrepreneur's Journey podcast. On the line with me right now is Barnaby Anderson, who is a longtime friend of mine, a fellow entrepreneur who I've connected with here and there for, for many years for all kinds of different reasons, not just business. Uh, Barnaby is an avid meditation expert. I don't know if you can be an expert at meditation. I guess you can, but Barnaby does a lot of it, and we can perhaps touch on that at some point, uh, as well as having had his own business and selling it and starting up a couple of interesting startups at the moment, too. So uh, we're going to talk about the entire story uh, behind Barnaby, and uh, hopefully we can learn a lot. So Barnaby, thank you for joining me. Wow, that's that's great to be here, Aaron. The entire story, that sounds quite um, formidable. <laughs> I'm sure we'll have some fun. Daunting, yes. Uh, Barnaby, you are a an Aussie, I believe, from yep. born and raised. Uh, yeah, I was born. I uh, brought up in Sydney in the Blue Mountains, so that's where I spent my childhood. And uh, then my adolescence was down in uh, Geelong near Melbourne, and um, moved up to Brisbane in '95. When uh, basically I moved here the month that the World Wide Web pretty much started, and that's um, that's when things started to really take off for me on a business front. How old are you then? So. Uh, so 95, I was, um, so I was 24 and I'd, um, just moved, basically I just, I started my family. So, um, my, basically my, my daughter was, uh, was on her way. So it was like a, a massive time of change. I'd already been working in the tech industry for about two years in Sydney, um, for a software, a very small software company, um, doing design and uh, technical writing. And, um, th- there was, there was no internet or there was nothing that anybody, uh, CompuServe was the was the thing that we were into back then, so, uh, so it was a very different time. Your background then did did you study design and these technical subjects in a university degree or technical qualification after high school or how did you get into it? I had no technical qualifications whatsoever, so I um, I always came from a um, an artistic background. So while I was young. Um, like in 1979, I represented Australia um, in the Year of the Child as a young artist. So you could say that art and design were, were sort of part of my skills, as was actually acting and writing. So those were all things that I was very passionate about as a, as a teenager. Uh, I guess computers always interested me. And I never did um, – while I was at uni, I did an arts degree, you know, like philosophy and um, comparative religion and that sort of stuff. Um, but I soon realized that that was not really going to go anywhere. So I, uh, I dropped out of uni after being there for a couple of years. And um, I was more interested in, I must have been quite ambitious because I just felt I was hanging out with people who were just drifting by. And uh, I quickly got a job at a, a small software company. Why do they hire you <laughs> if you have no <laughs> qualifications? They, I, I, I was just quite persistent. <laughs> I, was, I just said, um, I must have impressed him somehow. I was like 21 and I just showed up. And um, yeah, it was bizarre because he'd been used to hiring people with full-on programming experience and he... I think he was just looking for somebody who could do technical writing, and I had no experience with that either. I just told him I could do it, and uh, so he gave me that opportunity. And um, I worked with he was he kept me on for a couple of years, so I must have done a reasonable job. Uh, wow! And, uh, so you learned so, on the yeah, job, basically. I, what What was that, Yaro? You learned on the job, so like technical writing and design, which possibly would be Photoshop back then as well, or something like that. Um, Adobe InDesign, I don't uh, know. Yeah, we- yeah, well, look, we had we, he was actually a Mac programmer, and I mean, seriously, we were working on like those classic SEs, I think they were called, like the small all-in-one piece ones. It was very, very. This is the early '90s. It was very strange times. <laughs> so, um, okay, so and, that was your doorway into the world of technology, anyway, in terms of actually getting money from it. Yeah, and uh, but and things really things really changed when we moved to, to Brisbane. I, I'd never been to Brisbane in my life. It was quite a strange thing to move here. Uh, which is where I've been living for the last 17 odd years. Um, but I, I quickly found a job in a, uh, in a basically like a hardware shop, like selling computers. And uh, I really, I'd never done sales before and I, I really didn't like it. The people I was working with, they were dreadful. It was just a, basically I was quite terrified. Um, but there was this, this magical day where I went downstairs to the agency and there were all these magazines, um, tech magazines, and one of them had on the front cover, the World Wide Web is coming or something like that. And I just had no idea what that meant. I was like, what? This is February of 95. And I was like, what is this? And it said internet. And I, this is a strange thing for you and I to, to even try to think of. But I, I didn't understand what those words meant. 
like I was, I've been working in the tech industry for two or three years and I was reading this word internet and it was appearing all over the place. And I was like, what does this even mean? And, uh, and so I bought the magazine and took it upstairs to my, uh, where I was working and I was flipping through it, trying to understand what, what it was talking about. And at the back was a, an ad that said, uh, website design by this company called Firehorse. And I thought, wow, what, what are they talking about? So I just gave them a call and they said that they were giving a presentation, a business presentation that night and I could rock up. So I, um, yeah, I just went along. I just thought, well, this sounds really interesting. So I, I went along that evening and uh, sure enough, they gave a presentation. They were, they actually were a bunch of hippies. They were very strange guys and they, uh, they were forming probably pretty much maybe, maybe even the first web design company in Australia. And, uh, they, uh, they took me, and I was so entranced with what they were doing uh, that they took me back to their place that evening. And no joke, they were a bunch of dope smoking hippies who spent most of their time living out of teepees. Uh, <laughs> but they, they were living in this, this, yeah, I'm not kidding. And, uh, and they were living in this house, um, in this sort of strange house in Brisbane. And uh, I was peering through all the smoke and coughing and fluttering as they were showing me Netscape 0.93b. And uh, I was just so blown away. I was like, far out. This is amazing. You can actually put up a page online and you can show the world. And they, were, they gave me the very rudimentaries of, of HTML to go home that night and start teaching myself. And that's what I did. I quit, I quit that job the next week. <laughs> wow. Um, Barnaby, I, just, yeah. I don't know if you have any downloads going. The Skype connection is a little bit laggy. Uh, if you can have a quick look if you've got anything that might be slowing it down uh, while we continue. Okay. Yeah, it just it's pretty good, but I'm just getting a little bit of skipping in your voice. It could just be me. Um, but to continue the story, so okay, you you've you discover the internet thanks to a bunch of hippies, <laughs> which is <laughs> very I love the the dichotomy there. Uh, you know, people not typically known for technology introduce you to the internet. Now, how does that lead into you? I guess becoming an entrepreneur and actually starting your own business. Well, I. Uh... So I worked with them for about six months, but they were really, they were not business guys. They were all over the place. I was a bit like a contractor as I found my feet with, with building websites. And then I, um, another guy, basically I formed a partnership with another guy who set up a small head of design studio. And I basically was like a partner in that. So it wasn't quite still my, my own business, but I was basically running that, that, that new department and, um, I had a share in it, but that, that still didn't work. It was 95. It was too early. People weren't really interested in websites, um, businesses weren't so then I that that basically fell apart and because there just wasn't enough there and I went out the next year um, on my own I started uh, um, a live online which was the company that I ran for the next decade or more and uh, yeah just basically start I, I, that was a web design firm so it was based, based around finding clients and selling them websites and doing online marketing and and all of that so I built that up from just myself um, eventually uh, yeah I, I sold that about a a dozen years later, uh, there were probably like 10 staff and we had hundreds of clients around the world. So, All right, you're skipping a bunch of stuff I have to ask you about yeah. this <laughs> business. <laughs> so Alive Online, it's starting as a, I'm assuming a sort of a design, website design, maybe hosting kind of company. Did And I'm assuming you've also just had your first child around this time as well? like Because you're leaving the consistent income of a, a reliable job to do your own thing. And you, I guess you're already contracting, so you kind of had a feel for what that's like. Is there concerns that this business is not going to work? Do you have savings built up? Are, you have a deadline for how, how quickly you need to start making money from it? Like, How did that play out? So uh, when I was working with the... So in, that, in 1995, I was working at the... Uh, the sales, the hardware sales computer place. And that was obviously, a, um, I had a consistent income there, but I left that for, for no income uh, to go and do this contracting work, for this web design firm, because it was too exciting. And then, but that became more and more, it was basically falling apart. So then when I formed that partnership with that guy, yeah, that was a consistent income. He, he basically was bankrolling it. So he paid me a weekly wage. And my, my job was to, was to build up the department and get clients. And, uh, and then when that, that didn't, basically that ran out of steam. I left that, but I didn't, I had no other income. I just chose to step out there and I thought, well, I can, I can win clients. I, um, he basically lost confidence with it and I felt, well, I, I can, I can make this thing work. So, and yes, we had a, a baby and she, Mia, Mia's her name and she was probably, um, well, that was in April of 96. So she would have been six months old. So yeah, I just stepped out there. I, I had 
no savings, uh, nothing. I would guess, <laughs> you know, when you're young and foolish. But uh, but basically, I've, I've pretty much always thought like that since then, where I just well, I can make this work. I don't care what the obstacles are. Um, I guess I just had some confidence where I could. Yeah. Tell us about these first few years then. Did, did the confidence, was it warranted? How did, did you have clients? Did you make enough money to feed your baby, <laughs> pay your rent? Well, um, yeah, I did. So I guess, well, I probably, I wasn't completely stupid. Uh, no, I guess I was, um, I, there was some strategy there in that while I was working with um, building up that, that design firm, uh, I'd made an alliance with basically Brisbane's largest IS, ISP at the time. Power Up, they, um, and so and Power Up had they were an amazing company. They were just growing in huge leaps and bounds. And I, uh, while I was doing that website design stuff, I was hosting all the clients with them. Now this is in the day. Basically, web hosting is so small at this point. It, it isn't even really what we would think of it today in the in a, like a completely separate industry. Back then, it was like this small add-on feature that ISPs were running, and so that that whole deal was about connecting people up. And so I would go out there and visit them, and I said, "Look, guys, I'm." So when I when I when I left that um, the partnership, I went out there and saw them and said, "Look, I'm going to be doing this full on." And they said, "Well, we'll just send you leads." And so I said, "Great." So that's basically how things kicked off. Was I was like, "Well, I, I'm pretty sure that these guys are going to have leads," and um, and so it was through my relationship with them, and it, it built up, and they were con- you know there were leads coming through, and I'd go out to networking events, I'd go to business breakfasts. Um, and eventually, I actually moved myself actually into their organization. Literally, like it was like I, I said to them, well, let's give me a little desk and I'll, I'll run everything from in here. And uh, But that was a couple of years later. So that relationship with those guys ran like 96, 97, 98, sort of 99. And um, and where it, it stopped working were, was basically where they they actually really ramped up the web hosting. So they went from being purely an ISP with a bit of web hosting into becoming Web Central, Australia's largest web hosting company. And I mean, there were just so many opportunities, Yara. Like I mean, when I think about things, it was like I was constantly at the the birth of a massive industry and I didn't take the opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> you must I be mean, frustrated. <laughs> yeah, like there were so many opportunities. Like so the number of times where I could have literally made many, many millions were just extraordinary. Um, so like when... Basically, like um, those guys who ran who ran Power Up and turned it into Web Central uh, when they sold it for forty million dollars. Like I, I was there with them in those early early meetings when we were just talking about what this thing could be and do, and I couldn't actually see it. I couldn't see. I don't think that they could even quite see it, but they could see something. And because put it this way, if I'd really seen what was where things were going to go, I could have moved those meetings in different ways and. It was just very interesting that I was mm. still not not just naive, but I was really, um, I guess my, my thinking was still very limited. I mean, the power of hindsight, it, 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 it's like that. Yeah, I think everyone and, uh, can t- tell a story about, oh, I wish I did that idea. Like I had the idea for uh, for eBay before eBay did, but I just didn't do it, you know, that sort of thing. But uh, you obviously had a business that did give you a living and and it it continued to grow it sounds like it was just you sitting in an office for quite a number of years though as the only employee or the only worker for for your your company is that right yeah look i it was i guess i was um and that was probably you know that was the that was the tough part was that i was very focused on getting clients and doing the work like as i said i was coming from the artistic background you know the um how things looked were really important to me and i um and so I guess I was really focused on doing a good job for clients, making them a website that looked great and just getting the next client. So it wasn't until I probably started going to more seminars, like in 99, 2000, when I started getting exposed to a lot of other business concepts, like about leverage and scalability. And I started to look at things from quite a different angle. And and uh, so that was that, that sort of opened up my eyes to, wow, do I really want to you know, keep on doing this just me and I still hadn't really, I hadn't figured out how I could make changes in that area. Yeah. Um, Which is a, a very common question, and this is something that would be great for you to answer now, uh, Barnaby. A lot of people are good consultants or people who are making money doing some sort of creative job, if, whether it's building a website, doing desktop publishing, uh, you know, writing email marketing campaigns for people. They're acting as contractors, you know, freelance writing even. That Those are all good 
paying contract jobs, but they're not really businesses. And it's a common desire, especially after two or three years of doing this, when you realize your your income potential is capped because you get paid by the job or paid by the hour. So you don't have the, the leverage and the scalability there as a solo entrepreneur in this case. So you have to transition from that to hiring your first person, hiring more people, getting more clients, and, and juggling all of that while maintaining the cash flow of what you're currently doing. And it sounds like you managed to do that. So could you explain how? Okay, well, it was it was quite a process. I mean, this whole thing went on over many years. So like... I. To really go into there's some there's some tricky parts here like um sort of around that that turn the millennium I I had one very large client like I won a very big job but things didn't go well with it and um they they had a change of management and, and there were just all these these problems basically and I, I I got really burnt and so I basically decided to to step away from I sort of took a step back probably for a couple of years so there I was building up this this web design business. And I've been around Web Central getting built. And then I was like, well, this is all, you know, this is actually pretty painful. Some of these web clients can be really, it can, it can go south, not even for any fault of my own. And so I stepped back and just did some pure consulting for a couple of years, as in like took a contract. And um, I, do you, want, do you want to know some of these really crazy stories, Jaro? Oh, you, you can't say that without giving us at least one Barnaby. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I... Yeah, I mean things things got pretty low because I'd used up all my capital and I um so I remember I took a uh, actually I took a job amongst all of that when when things and I actually went and took a uh, a job at a multimedia training firm and they wanted a, an e-commerce strategist and I went in there and just told them what I could do and they hired me but the the salary wasn't great like it was probably 50 60k something like that and I just had so many commitments I just so basically what I'm saying is I, I stayed there probably for maybe two months and did that. And I went, I walked in one day to the manager and said, I just can't do this anymore. I have to leave because you're not paying me enough. And they couldn't afford to pay me any more, they said. And so I, I just walked out, um, not to anything else. It was just like I, did, I just chose to, to leave there with the presumption that I would be able to go and get more money and that the opportunity cost was too high by staying there and spending my eight hours every day in their office. So I, I left there, even though I had my family and my daughter was like now five or so. And, um, and then I, I started looking around for another, another contract and I found this, um, this company. They were making these amazing uh, – they, they had this email marketing system where they wanted to send out emails that would be uh, animated. And so they told me that they wanted to have this full-on JavaScript programmer, this whole team of them actually, and they said to me, can you do this? And I said to them, no. And they said, well, we think you can. Can you start on Monday? <laughs> and so, Barnaby, you need to do a, a product on how to get jobs you shouldn't get because that sounds like the consistent <laughs> thing here in your story so far. <laughs> <laughs> so I, but it was just amazing to be in the interview and to tell them I couldn't do it. And they said that they thought I could. And um, anyway, so I, I started on Monday and I was terrified, like full on JavaScript programming to make these emails that people would get and have all these dots and images flying across the screen and I started pumping them out and um, they were so impressed. I was blown away that I could do it um, and so then they needed more people and then I, I hit upon this idea while I was in there. I thought, well, hang on, they're having trouble finding people. Why don't I see if I can find people? And so then I started putting ads in the paper and I started, so in my lunch breaks, I'd go up there and I'd interview somebody and ask them. I'd say to them, so do you want this job? And they'd say yes. And I'd say, how much money do you want per hour? And they'd say $30. I'd say, well, you know, give me your phone number and um, I'll get back to you. I walk back down to my office. I'd go to my manager and say, Hey, you, you want another programmer? Yeah. How much do you want to pay them? 50 bucks an hour. And so I just became the middleman and I probably brought in about six to eight programmers while I was there for that, um, that next year. And that just made me awesome cash. It was a great, a great job where so I'd basically you, be in there. And I'd... It's bizarre. You became a recruiter within a company you were working for where they, they decided you were good enough when you said you weren't. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And uh, what was amazing was that day when I actually got that job. So get this. So it was a Friday. Um, I'd used up – you can t tell that I'd, <laughs> I'd, I'd been sort of getting by by the scrape of my teeth. And um, that afternoon, actually, the rent had, was overdue by a month. And the car payments, well, they were going to come and repossess the car. It was a Friday. I went for the job interview. And, uh, and they said to me, we, you know, we want you. And I said, I can't do this, fully knowing that everything was going – it was going so badly if I didn't take this particular opportunity. And uh, it was just that what, what was amazing was 
it was like everything flipped on a dial. It went from being really dark to just going really well. Um, and, and actually by, by saying the truth as well. So I didn't have to lie. And it just brought all these amazing opportunities where I, yeah, I hired all these people and some of them are you know, still my friends today. I made some great connections there. Um, some, some of the people I hired, they were, they were fabulous. They were amazing. And, um, but it was just amazing to see the power. I, I guess that was my first true experience of leverage where I went, wow, hang on. I can be sitting here and sure, they're paying me 50 bucks, but I've got six people here and every hour that they work, I'm getting 20 bucks. And uh, I just managed all the invoices and everything. And, uh, because, and then the dot-com bust happened big time and the company just, it just exploded. <laughs> it just or imploded rather. And I, I remember that day that we were there when, when everybody was just running around and, and I was one of them and we were saying, come on, what code can we grab? What, what can we take from this thing, this, this, um, this carcass that is falling apart? Wow. We were sort of in, looking at the servers and, you know, the guys were coming in to try to pull it apart. I mean, seriously, it was like the end of 2000 and things were just, it was really falling apart. So uh, that was an interesting experience. Okay, you still haven't answered the question, though. How did you transition? Because obviously you went down before you went back up then, judging by this story. Well, I've gone, I've gone down and up quite a few times, Jaro. <laughs> <laughs> more, more times than I can. Yeah, and we, I'd love to cover every single one, Barnaby, but let's, let's try and answer that question because I know a lot of people are in that situation. They're a publicity expert now or a writer now or a, yep. even a blogger now, and they – make yeah, okay, okay money but they just want to turn to something a bit bigger get some employees and that transition is so hard so tell well, us when that, that worked for you so i guess getting that extra bit of cash behind me from that and then experiencing that power of the leverage of hiring people it really shifted my focus and i then i basically then decided that web design was something i could do and i could do it well again and but now i wanted to, to fold into that the web hosting so i realized i had to have a component that was going to be residual the residual income component became really important to me. And so I, um, just as I'd had with the, the recruitment system, I thought, well, um, I need to basically have a, a foundation where there are all, each client that comes in are paying a certain monthly fee. So that was the, that was the new system I then implemented. And then that gave me um, basically the basis for them to start hiring staff. So I went from it being just me to basically you know hiring hiring other people um and having a, a uh, basically a web hosting system that i was getting the residual income from okay so that's that's a pretty important point come up with a, a cash flow system that actually is sustainable rather than just doing one-off contract jobs where you don't know if the money will continue to come uh that sounds like it worked for you yeah, it did. Well, it worked for a few a few years. I guess that was the um well, it worked all the, that was basically the basis of the the whole program. It went from it being purely me doing the website design to having the uh, the hosting, employing support staff and, you know, getting 50 clients, 100 clients, paying that monthly fee and building it up. Um then having one staff, two staff, three staff, learning all about managing them, uh and then after doing that for a couple of years, then getting some uh, investment in there to then start expanding that further and having a new office premises. So that's how I, I just kept on ramping things up, basically. Maybe you can tell us about the investment, Barnaby. That why did you decide to get investment? Well, it was more like I had a, um, I had a friend and he was, he was watching what I was doing and he, he felt that he wanted to get into that space. And he said um, that basically let's let's expand this and i was like at that time i must admit i was like well i think we could probably do things even more interesting than just website design but but we decided to focus on that and so um yeah basically he he wanted to get in there and start you know having a new opportunity in that particular area of of technology he he'd run other businesses that were quite different and so um i i moved my office over to where to where he was we um I guess I, he was somebody who was very experienced in business. Well, that's how that's how it certainly looked to me. He'd had a few decades of it, and I, I guess I was looking for him for guidance. Really, I was like, well, okay, I don't I don't just want an um, investment here. I'm wanting to someone to sort of help me lead lead me the way through this this sort of tricky path of employing people, and uh, and so we we hired all these people, and uh, I started speaking. Actually, at that point, all these new doorways opened where I started speaking. Uh, around Australia and, and internationally, and um, 
and I think, hang on, it's, at some point around here, um, I meet you. Um, <laughs> at some so, point, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can't remember if it's before then or, you know, it's sometime around this, this area that, um, I, I think we probably meet up in 2005, 2006, something like that. And then y- you see me actually from this point on where I'm um, speaking and ramping things up with the live online. Yeah, and, and you know, as I talked to you, Barnaby, as you went through this process, it, it did seem like there was two forces at play your need to keep a business running on a model that has been proven, which is the hosting and the design, and, and that's a cash cow sort of thing that keeps the bills paid, that keeps the staff paid, but your own personal motivation to do something much different. Uh, you're kind of over the industry. You know, you've been in it for 10 years already almost there. So, uh, and you, you were trying to reconcile that. And it, it, I noticed, I think, um, obviously you have sold that business. So you're now moved on to projects that it sounds like you're much more passionate about. Can you explain how, and this is, I think as equal uh, as equally an interesting question when a person realizes that they no longer want to be in the business they're in, uh, and they want to try other things, how can you go about that? Do you like now that you've had the experience, would you recommend trying a clean break and selling the business or setting up some sort of unit within the existing business? Like, for example, you started doing selling from the stage, which wasn't exactly what you were doing prior to that. So it gave you, I guess, another creative outlet, which was different. Uh, you know, Can you talk about which is the best way to explore when you are kind of over your existing business and, and want to change? I guess that's one of the... Um, I, to be honest, I really struggled with that because... Uh, one of the one of the mentors I had in business, he he said this line to me uh, that I've never forgotten, and I found it really helpful in helping guide the things I do today. And that was make sure you put your ladder up against the right wall, so when you get to the top, you realise that you're actually at the right place you want to be. So I'd never really understood that before. So I'd never really thought through what my life would be like if I actually had a successful web hosting web design business, uh, because the more clients I got. But for me personally, look, I, I undoubtedly, a lot of people, well, there's a number of people in the world who can run those businesses really well. I wasn't one of them <laughs> in terms of like having um, a whole team of support staff answering technical questions. It, it really, it, it just wasn't me. And I, it took me a, a few years to realize that. And by the time I realized that I had so many clients, I, I didn't know how to get out of it. It was really tricky. And basically, the more clients I got, the bigger it became the more difficult it was. And I just got really stressed. Like it was just, I mean, when I say really stressed, I mean, if there's anybody out there listening to this who basically is in a business that they, they they don't like, um, and they don't know how to get out of it. I've been there. It's really painful. And that wasn't the only thing. I mean, I had a bunch of things that weren't working at that point. So it's like these waves of, you know, building something up, um, and then finding that, hang on, this isn't really me. And how do we get out of here? And it's not like a job you can quit. It's like, you've got all these, you know, all these clients you're responsible to and all these staff that you have all these obligations to and this rent to pay and, you know, insurances and the list just goes on and on and on. And so um, I I truly, I probably spent a um, a couple of years, I I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to get out of it. And I, um, thankfully, I I had somebody else come in and they were helping me manage things in that business from a, um, like from a friend point of view. And they helped me get some new staff on board one person in particular who became an expert at managing all the clients. And basically he became like my manager, like my CEO. So I realized that I needed to have someone like that step in and look after everything, which helped me step back and eased up a lot of my stress. Um, and I, I just had no opportunity really to think creatively in that, in that space. So, so you could probably tell that the things that really drive me are um, creative thinking, design, new ideas. And here I was just, managing all these people's technical issues basically um everything from um you know service that go down email that goes down websites all all these things uh, as well as there were creative elements too but it was very stressful and it was only when it dawned on me i actually i met up with one of the guys that i used to know I, i did a bit of consulting for him once um in his web design firm and i caught up with him at a party and this is really when i was at my wits end i was like what am i gonna do and he said, and I, I saw him. I hadn't seen him for probably four or five years. And the last time I saw him, he was this weedy, thin, pale, geeky guy. And I saw him at this party, and he was all, you know, buffed up and smiling. And he was just—he looked totally different. And I said, "Wow, 
what have you done? And he said, I got out of the tech industry. <laughs> and um, he was doing a completely different business. And I said to him, how did you do that? I'm in the same space as you. How, do, how can I get out of this? And he said, well, I sold it to my manager. And I was like, wow. So I just went back and did the same thing. That easy, huh? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I mean, like, yeah, obviously none of this stuff is really that easy. But, but that I, I was able to, to pull it off. I was able to, you know, um, go through with the deal. I was able to show, uh, yeah, basically he, he was an amazing guy. He was, he was running things really well. He turned things around in a lot of departments and, uh, he, he started to pull up his own team and, um, he, he got, he raised some investment capital himself. And so look, I, by no means, I, I had a lot of fires I had to put out at this point, um, because I wasn't really, enjoying that particular business so things some areas weren't working um some were and so i didn't it wasn't like I, I didn't come out of it like a you know a millionaire or anything even close to that it was like i, I was able to just get out of that business yeah and that's it's nice to point that out i mean i've interviewed people who've sold a website for you know three hundred thousand dollars to people who've sold their businesses for multi-millions and some people are still in the same businesses but i think this is a great uh, example where just getting yourself out of something almost because it's an emotional release than anything else not not about the money just so you can create the space to do something when you well and truly are over what you're currently doing can we just touch a little bit on how that deal went down whatever you're comfortable sharing with barnaby because i'm sure there's some people right now who are going wait a sec i've got a manager or i've got someone who's heavily involved in my company but they're an employee maybe they could buy it. And, and how, how's the best way of going about beginning that discussion and, and closing a deal? Well, I guess I just, um, I just brought it up. You know, I just, uh, it, he was doing such a good job. Like he, he was really being responsible for the business. He, he wasn't just, he really cared about it. So, and he was a really great guy. He had great ethics. Um, I knew that he cared about the clients and he was, he was young. So he was young. he, he had a lot of energy. He ha- he was very driven. He was very ambitious. And I thought, wow, he's probably got what it would take to. S-. And he, but at the same time, he was afraid. Like he, in terms of, well, maybe not afraid is the right word, but he he hadn't ever done his own business before. So like he had a degree. He'd been brought up, you know, in a very, I mean, he'd done everything very properly. And I could see that there was like an entrepreneur in him, but it, it needed to be unleashed, if you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. So. It wasn't like I, I don't think he was going to go out there necessarily and just start something himself. So I, I felt like, well, here's your, here's the opportunity. So I, I presented it to him like that, and he, well, he basically said to me he was kind of waiting for me to say something. So he must have had some sense that of how things were going to go, and so um, I just presented the deal. We we negotiated terms about the money, and um, we got legal contracts together. Uh, yeah, we, we just did everything right. I signed everything over to him. And that was what year? That was in um that was in the beginning of two thousand and ten. The deal was done in finalized in April. Okay, so you're a free man. Uh in terms of not having any responsibilities to the business. Yeah, I'm assuming you've at least covered your debts. Like you said, you didn't become a millionaire, but you've broken away financially from it, so you're you're stable. Uh yeah. how did that feel? It was amazing. Like it was just like, well, I mean, uh, we're not going to go too much into this, but I'd also been through um, at, at that same time a number of those sort of endings on a very personal front as well. So my my marriage had ended, and <laughs> I'd had quite a lot of things happen in that previous um, eighteen months or so. So it was um, a real. It wasn't just the end of my uh, running that company, which I've been running. So it was two thousand April two thousand and. Um, 10 and I'd begun it in April 1996. So I'd run that for about 15 years. And so, and my marriage had gone for about that long as well. So it was this complete change in my life where I was like, okay, all these things that I felt um, basically weren't working. Um, I was now, uh, basically that was just me there. And I was able to look at things with a, with a fresh eye. And I felt, um, I just, I guess I, I was probably quite stunned um, <laughs> And I, I realized I just needed some time out where I'd, um, I'd just been going at things so hard for so, so many years. Uh, and I, I wanted to have the space to, to think up new ideas, but I, I also recognized that I just, I probably just didn't have it 
I didn't have the um, you know, the fuel inside me to do that. And it was probably important that I just take some time out. So that's what I did for the rest of the year. What did you do? This is when the meditation comes into it? Uh, yeah, I did probably more of that. I, I, all through, actually, all through all those years, I'd always probably gone to India for about at least one or two months every year. So um, because of my drive to take time out to go meditate, um, that was also one of the, the elements for running these businesses because I the kind of lifestyle I wanted to lead wasn't one that I could fit into somebody else's nine to five job. So I had to be somebody who was doing my things my way. And so, um, so when I took that, that year off, I, well, I spent more time with my daughter. I, um, I was, she was now a teenager and I was, um, raising her and I, um, I took up hip hop dancing and just, you know, I, I joined a theater company and did some improv theater, uh, just sat around reading. Um, I just, I did a few clients, like I was doing a little bit of consulting and um, little things here and there. Um, but I, I probably, you could probably say I'd been burnt out. And uh, I just thought, well, I just need to recuperate before I take on anything else. Mm -hmm. Okay, so bring us up to date then. That's only two years ago as we record this. So what have you been doing since then? Um, well, I, I became very fascinated after all of that with, um, with crowdsourcing. I saw, I guess, I was always interested in the, the power of the crowd, and um, not just social networks, but what people could do collectively together. And so I, um, I came up with an idea, which I worked on uh, all through 2011, of a, um, a crowdfunding website, but in the green space. So I guess what I resolved within myself, I, in that time off, I, I came up with like a list of criteria of like what, what would be my rules for doing business from this point on. And so there had to be things like it had to be fun. It had to be something that would make a difference to society. It had to be something that would have leverage. It had to be something that would be endlessly scalable. Uh, I, had all, I had 17 rules that I was going to follow from this point on whenever I would assess a business. And if it didn't fit these, I wasn't going to do it. And so, and, um, yeah, and so I, I wanted to set up a website that was going to help people in the green and ecological space to, to raise funds for their projects. So, uh, so I had a few friends who helped me with setting that up. Um, I spent a year working on the, the, the code and the project. I, I hired people for that. Um, and so that's a, uh, that's a website that is still being, I mean, it's, it's working now, but it's, um, it needs more projects in there. So that's something that we've been working on. And at the same time, it was like I, while I committed myself to that project, another project sort of was born out of it because I, how I invented the brand for that project, which is called the green crowd. So the green crowd uh, is, is basically the world's only um, crowdfunding eco green website and but how I invented the brand for it was again I wanted to go to the crowd like I thought well I want to actually get the community involved in actually naming this and branding it and I was looking around and nobody else was doing that style of branding people would you know go and see a branding consultant and they you pay them thirty thousand dollars and they pull a name out of the air and say that's what you should call it and so I mean they have their own little internal focus groups and they've got a lot of creativity there but I I basically invented this system of going to specific target markets and running in-depth surveys across hundreds of people or more and creating a name. And so I did that with the green crowd. And then I, I had, um, I was working with other consultants, um, in the trademark space and they were saying what I was doing was really interesting and they had other clients who wanted to do that. And I was like, wow, maybe I could actually get some clients through this method and help fund the other projects I'm doing. And so then that became, what basically is called Brand Allowed. And so Brand Allowed is my new uh, branding venture, which uses branding through a crowdsourcing method. And so then I've had clients through that. And, uh, and so that's basically what I've been doing for this last 18 months. And just to clarify, that's not, not just simply here's a logo and having the crowd choose which one they think is best. How exactly does it work? No, it's it's very it's what happens is that we uh well, through all my background of uh, keyword research SEO uh, I'm very much into looking at well where are the numbers where are people looking what are they typing in where's the trends and so working with a with a client or whatever the project is coming up with all the words that that they think people are using um, coming up with whatever names they've got we then brainstorm those. And there's usually quite a list. And then I go away and further brainstorm that and go through all these databases I've got access to. And um, like this is a typical model where, and this is what I did with the green crowd. So I, I came up with about 5,000 names for it. 
And then I whittled it down to about 500 and had people voting on that. And so from that, we take it down to 100, the top 100 names that people are voting on. And then from there, we just keep whittling it down through about seven different levels. And so you get like a top 50, a top 20, a top 10, down to a top two, and then top winning name. At the same time, we're making sure that the trademarks are available or, you know, that there's at least a good chance that they can get registered, the dot coms available. We do all these checks and then there's this winning name. And then we do the same process with logos. And so the, the actual people that we're wanting to target are the ones who actually come up with the name and the, the whole design which means that it's got a much better chance of actually connecting with the audience when it's launched. And so for, for um, a number of the projects I've been running, um, including Brand Aloud and The Green Crowd and uh, one, other, one other smaller one I'm about to launch, I've used that process. And, uh, and some of the clients I've been working with, they've just been thrilled because we've come up with names that, that they would just never have thought of. Uh, just, but they, they, they had their own ideas. But it was funny, very often the ideas that they have, the target market doesn't actually like. And it's quite something for the for the owner to to grapple with that because here I am saying to them, well, they're actually paying, they're paying for me to tell them often that their name is no good and that actually this name over here is the one that actually uh, the people that want to sell to actually like more than that one. So uh, to clarify this, it's it's like you do a massive keyword generation as you would almost do for for search engine optimization to generate just hundreds and thousands of possible names and start whittling them down. And then once you get to a small enough selection, you get actual human beings to say which one they like the best. Now, you said it's the target market that you can go to. Does that like limit what sort of industries you can service? Like, How do you find enough people to survey regard, regarding whatever industry a person might be coming to you, you know, asking for, for research data? Well, basically, yeah, I, I can research almost anything now. We've got a list of over 2 million people across nearly every demographic. So, uh, and how we're able to do this is we literally pay them. So we're, we basically pay people to do the surveys and to do the interviews, which means I can turn things out very quickly. So it's not just like, so if you wanted to actually, let's say you had a brand and you felt intuitively that it was going to be, you know, it was aimed at women and it was aimed at women like in their thirties and forties. Uh, then basically I can go after that demographic. Even, and let's say one of the, one of the clients we've had recently, they were wanting to go after the tradies. It was a construction industry. So we went after just people working in the construction industry. And so it was a specific building product. And so it had no, your opinion actually, and my opinion meant nothing for that product. It was these guys who work in that field every day. And so we, we worked with them and they, um, yeah, they, they picked the name. Okay. Well, that uh, sounds very appealing. I know when I hear that story, it sounds like a great way to choose a brand, you know, more than just the logo, the, everything, what your company is going to be called, what, what it's going to look like, plus the fact that you can trademark it and get the .com. So it's like a nice, I guess, starting your business, something you should do just part of the process and takes away a lot of the guesswork because you're letting your target market decide what works. So great idea, Barnaby. Um, how, uh, how can we find out more about that? Well, that one, um, if you go to um, brandaloud.com or so .com.au, so that um, brandaloud, that's A-L-O-U-D, brandaloud.com. And um, yeah, so uh, that's, uh, I've been running that for probably almost a year now. Um, and it's, it's really exciting because I, I love the, uh, the creativity in that. And I also like the, the validity of it. Like I like to do things where there's actually some basis. It's not just, because, you know, anybody can call something whatever they like, but What's the chance of that really working? I, I'm, I'm really interested in looking at things from a scientific point of view. And I guess I've, for many, many years, I've, I mean, in the whole time I've been running all these businesses, I've been coming across, you know, the, the top branding experts in, um, in the city and, you know, the tens of thousands that they charge. And I know how they do it. They, you know, they sit around and they, they think up names and they, they pick one that they like. And then they say to the client, here's the name. But really, like, what, what evidence do they have to back that up? So that always bothered me a little bit. And I'm, I'm guess I've, I've put together a system which can actually put some scientific data. Hmm. Uh, I mean, in, I, even if these large branding companies, let's say they are doing a lot of focus groups and a lot of market research, uh, $30,000 is out of reach for most small businesses. And you can get a similar kind of research done it, uh, by using the, the, the wonderful scale of the internet to send out surveys and, and collect that data uh, for much less money. So, you know, it, it is a nice option for those who don't have the, 
uh, I, I guess it's it's in between the you're not going to spend 30 grand like coke or whatever well they probably spend more than that but you know <laughs> yeah. whatever it is and you're not guessing by for example going to 99 designs and just putting up a brief and just choosing the one you like best yeah it's in between that so you're spending a little bit more than 99 designs but you're getting some research behind the decision to to what logo you use so Anyway, Barney, a great idea, brandallowed.com. It was thegreencrowd.com. Is that the other? Yeah, that's the other one, yeah. It, and it's the in that? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah. The yeah. Green I'm, negotiating, I'm negotiating with somebody to get the, the other one at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, those are great. Uh, two URLs, you can check out your work. Now, um, it's a good time, I think, to wrap up the interview. Uh, first of all, thank you for sharing, uh, I guess, some of the personal stuff with uh, the story of selling your business and starting it and the roller coaster ride you've certainly had uh, going up and down with the different projects and, and seeing you know, people around you in different businesses as the internet grew up too. It must have been terribly difficult as an entrepreneur wanting to, to not jump ship every two seconds uh, with you know, all the stuff going on around you. Um, can we end the interview, Barnaby, perhaps just thinking about a person who was, was in your situation, uh, you know, maybe has had a successful company, but really they want to jump on something different right now. I know you've, you've given some advice in that regard, you know, sell to your manager, for example, but, uh, I think people really are afraid of, of doing this and they're also extremely stressed and it's hard to make decisions when you are stressed and you're, you know, you're walking into your coffee shop every day and making sure your, your staff are getting paid and your customers are getting their coffees and all these things when really what you want to do is, you know, come up with some designer fashion and sell it online and that's, you just don't have time to do it. You have to run your coffee shop or something like that or even you're in some kind of online business and you want to move to a different online business. Whatever the case may be, you sound like a person who is really good at transitions and dealing with the ambiguity behind leaving something and starting something else. And even now with your current projects, they're just in startup mode, as I understand it. So you're, you're facing a lot of ambiguity there. So you're good at this. You're good at facing the fear and doing it anyway. Uh, can you give people, how do you do that? Like what's, <laughs> how do you become like Barnaby and become that fearless? Well, it's, I don't know if this is really going to help anybody because I know I've, I, as, as you said, I've been there and I know how hard and terrifying it can be. And people are stuck in so many different areas of their lives. You know, people can be stuck in, in a relationship or they can be stuck in a job or they can be stuck in a business. Uh, they can be stuck in any number of things. And usually it's about the fear, the fear of um, they, they want something new. They want to go and do something new, but they're afraid of, of basically of failing. They're afraid of if they give up what they've got, that they'll fail. And that keeps them where they are. But every day that they stay where they are, they're sort of dying inside. And they keep looking at other people and they keep fantasizing about, well, what that person's got over there, I don't have that. Why can't I have the life that I, that I would love? Uh, they've got all these ideas and that can consume them for, for years. And, well, we've only, we've only got so many years to live, basically. And when I, realized, when I really realized all this, in a way, all I can say is that you kind of just have to let things fall if they have to. You know, sometimes there's no other option than to let it all collapse, to get out. <laughs> One of my friends, he said to me, you know, Barnaby, there's, there's no neat way for you to do this. And I guess that was, that really started to affect me. I was like, wow, okay, I keep looking. I keep looking for the easy solution. I keep looking for the neat solution here. And there isn't one. And so the more I've realized that, the more I've been less afraid to step up and, and take action in, the, in these areas where, you know, often, very often, a lot of the time, there is no smooth, easy way to do something. But if I don't take some action, I'm going to be stuck and staying where I have been for years. And that's just become more and more untenable to me. It's like, wow, I, I, you know, I'm alive. I've got this life. And it's precious. And it's too short for me to be spending it worrying and, and just, you know, having an awful time basically. And so, and sure, you know, it's, if you've got lots of responsibilities, I'm not telling you to just throw caution to the wind. I understand, but I'm also somebody who, you know, I've had a family, you know, I've raised the child. She's a teenager now. She's doing year 12. I've, I've had staff, I've had businesses. I've, I've done all these things. And I also know that sometimes, you know, you just can't be careful in terms of sometimes you just uh if you if you stay too careful you stay stuck and so sometimes there is nothing else to do other than to take what appears to be the most terrifying and crazy risk 
But uh, for me, I'm really glad that I've taken those every step of the way. Fantastic, Barnaby. Uh, that's a lovely way to end this interview. And thank you for sharing your story. Again, if you want to find out more about Barnaby, you've got brandallowed.com and thegreencrowd.com. You can check out his current projects there. And uh, Barnaby, thank you. Thanks, Joe. It's been really great talking to you. And if you're interested in getting more interviews like with this with Barnaby, there's plenty more in the Entrepreneur's Journey podcast archives. Lots of entrepreneurs there sharing their stories of how they've uh, left their jobs, made an online income, started companies, sold them for millions. Great stories, very inspiring, just like Barnaby. So head to my blog, entrepreneurs-journey.com, or you can Google my name, which is Yaro, Y-A-R-O. And I look forward to uh, talking to you again on a future podcast. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye. Oh, 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 oh,